So one of the things we have missed is the entire storyline where Paul Orndorff teams up with Hulk Hogan. They have several matches. They have a falling out and Orndorff turns on him. I was caught totally off guard watching these week by week because all of a sudden there's Paul Orndorff with the Bobby Heenan. Yes. And it took me a second. I was like, what the fuck's going on? Oh, my God. Paul Orndorff has turned heel. Yes. And he has turned on Hulk Hogan. And they're having a match tonight. Yes. Wow. I, I thought at first this may actually be the famous cage match, but I'm guessing that's the next episode. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So, Orndorff is there. He is posing in front of one of those folding mirrors. So, there's three shots of him. And he says, what we have here is three, the three best bodies in the world. One body is the next world champion. One is the man who left Hulk Hogan laying in the ring. And the third is the only real American. Hogan does a promo on Orndorff. Actually did a promo on Orndorff. That's what he Thank called you. him. Orndorff. You are correct. That is true. Called him a Benedict Arnold. Vowed he's going down. He had all the little Hulkamaniacs on his side. Turned his back on them. What's he going to do when Hulk Hogan runs wild on him? We have clips from August. So this is still September. Two months before this show. Uh, Orndorff is in New York with Hogan. They had a tag match. As I recall, I do. I actually remember this. Like they did one match. I think it was the Moon Dogs, where Orndorff refused to tag Hogan in. He wrestled the entire match by himself and still won. And Hogan was happy, but he was confused. And then when they did a rematch with the Moon Dogs, Hogan went the whole way. And then Orndorff was begging for a tag. And finally, when Hogan went to tag him, Orndorff walked out on him or something like that. But here we see Orndorff very cleanly laying Hogan out, giving him the pile driver. That is in August of 1986. We have another Hulk Hogan promo. He can't believe this is happening. It has come down to the 11th hour. Orndorff sold him out over nothing, over jealousy. He knows there's a few confused people, he says, out there. He, a few confused people out there, he says. Your people, the ones that aren't Hulkamaniacs. He laid out straight, he says. God created the heaven, the earth, the Hulkamaniacs, and then the 24-inch pythons. This apparently is from the newest testament. Yeah, I missed this one. I was yes. unaware of, of those four days. I was absent that Sunday. He says the old battered, broken down Hulkster is running yes. better than ever. It's like... It's 1986. 86 here. He's doing this promo. I forget about the next 20 years. He was still going to be champion for another year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. God created 24-inch Python to set people like you straight, he says. <laughs> Hogan would be a hell of a preacher when you think about it. What the hell of a promo here? Yeah, of course it was. It was Hulk Hogan, Pete Hogan. Gene interviews Heenan and Orndorff. Heenan declares... Yes, everyone, we still have not had a match yet. No. <laughs> this is about the 18th segment. Although only about five minutes, to be fair. Gene interviews Heenan and Orndorff. Says, uh, Heenan says, that albino ape is a liar. I guess referring to Hogan? Yes. The last man on Earth that referred to as an albino is Hulk Hogan. Orndorff vows to rip Hogan's tongue out. And put it on his championship belt. Now, they can't just be subtle and have Orndorff come out to Hulk Hogan's music. Orndorff has to declare that he's the real American and he's got the music to prove it. And as they walk away, a, a, a disgusted, appalled Gene Oakland shouts, Are you telling me you're stealing Hulk Hogan's music? And then Orndorff steals Hogan's music. So it is not the cage match, unfortunately. Uh, Hogan, our order comes out. Hogan comes out. Gene tries to interview him. Hogan just says, get in my way, mean Gene. And he grabs him, lifts him up, and sets him off to the side. <laughs> All right, so a couple of things right here. First off, it's, it's Orndorff Hogan. Orndorff is going to come out to Real American. And so what they basically do is they just play Real American. Yes, And Orndorff comes out, and it keeps going, and then Hogan comes out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Vince is apoplectic about him using this man's music. And Jesse Ventura, who won office, by the way, says, well, Hogan didn't write the song, so Orndorff has every right to use it. And I was like, no! That is not how copyrights work. Well, I mean... What are you talking about? He has every right to pay... Was it Rick Derringer? If you want to pay Rick Derringer all that Dupree, fucking money, but I'll, I'll bet you anything that he didn't pay him for that money. Jesse was out to lunch is. right here. Real American. I'm, Rick I'm, Derringer. I, yes, I'm 99% sure. 
So Hogan's making his way down the ring. Vincent Man is beside himself with the size of this man. He looks like a boxcar walking down the aisle, he says. That's a new one. So the storyline is Hulk Hogan is the world champion and the greatest wrestler in the world. But he is in a fury tonight at the betrayal of Paul Orndorff and thus he is off his game. The very first spot, the bell rings, Hogan raises his fist overhead and sprints forward, but Orndorff dodges. Hogan collides with a turnbuckle. They keep on brawling. Hogan makes a comeback, but he is easily distracted by Bobby Heenan because he's off his game tonight. Well, he's off his game, but the funniest thing about this is Heenan tries to interfere, Hogan's distracted, and he gets pummeled. He gets punched. He's standing in the apron and does a flop to the floor. Yes. So later, he starts to make this comeback, and Bobby Heenan interferes again, and Hulk Hogan is distracted. At this point, Jesse Ventura, who is supposed to be the heel commentator, flat out says, look at this dummy. This dummy got distracted twice. Yeah. (laughs) And in my brain, I'm thinking, you're fucking goddamn right he got distracted twice, and he is a dummy. He's a big dummy. Jesse Ventura on this show... It's like everything that he said was right. Well, like these baby faces are, look today, they're fucking these baby faces are cheating. These heels are getting screwed and like everything he says is true. And so Hogan gets distracted a second time. Heenan tries to interfere a third time. Finally he just reaches in and grabs Hulk's leg. Yep, he grabs his leg and all of a sudden from out of the crowd come a band of police officers and they grab Bobby Heenan and they arrest him. And I loved it with all of my heart because how many times has the, the guy, you know, he's, he's interfered multiple times, you know, sometimes it's a DQ, but you know, usually the ref is dumb. And then sometimes like the ref ejects the guy but the guy just comes back. I mean, finally, we got, like, what should be done. This guy kept interfering. And so fucking armed police showed up, and they arrested the guy. And they took him away. And they I don't know where they locked him. They threw him out of the building. Wherever they locked him, this fucking guy couldn't get back in. He was, he was so shown outside, banging on the glass doors, demanding to be let back in, and they refused. This must be the shit that I that I watched when I was young and long since forgot about, but it stuck with me. Like, if you interfere, you've got to be arrested. (laughs) You don't just keep interfering or get sent to the back and come back. Like, this is the way it should be done. Because once upon a time, these things made sense. They sure shit did make sense, except for everything on the show that was nonsensical that Jesse pointed out. (laughs) Well, it still made sense. It just was backward psychology. So Heenan is arrested and thrown out of the building. We go to the break. We come back. Orndorff is working Hogan over. Hogan is able to escape the pile driver. And it's fun watching these shows in order because you see the evolution of Hulk Hogan. Yes, he's almost got the full Hulk up down. It's not but quite up to the three punches in the big boot. Well, no, it is three punches, but he doesn't do the point first. No point. He just no. does. He, he gets punched a few times, and then he just starts blocking and punching. So this it's not the... like he gets punched a couple of times and then does the face and the finger point. Yes, this this was the first time he really did the the the, the kick out and drop or pop up to his knees and make that face with his look or face with his lips and Vince points out, look at the look at his face and he starts to shake up and he gets to his feet and shakes and shakes and there was no point but he he went through the whole thing and you can see really that he is starting to figure out there are things that I can do in every match mm-hmm. they're always going to work yes. And they allow me to kill myself less working yes. 300 days a year. You can so see unfortunately, it. like his work is really going to start to fall off here in the next couple of years. But I mean, even here still, him and Orndorff were working their asses off. Mm-hmm. And this was like a fun heavyweight championship wrestling match. If you like brawling, there was like one suplex in here. Everything else, I think, maybe a slam or two. Virtually everything else was a punch or a kick or a stomp or an elbow or a knee. There were no holds. There were a few maneuvers. <laughs> they just hit each other over and over again. It's funny because when you think back to history, 
like the idea was well fuck rick flair i mean he was the the greatest wrestler of the 80s and and hogan couldn't hold a candle to him and blah 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 and i mean flair was the greatest wrestler in this country of the 80s but i mean if you want to talk like 87 88 89 yeah hogan couldn't hold a candle to him but fucking 1986 this guy had some great fucking championship matches. And the difference was, unlike Flair, he won. That and he decisively plus. defeated all of these challengers. In, in the end, he always got the best of everybody. Yes. And he yeah, was fucking great in 1986. I guarantee you, if you polled wrestling fans, if you polled Hulk Hogan fans after they paid their money to see a Hulk Hogan match in 1986, were they ever disappointed? The answer is virtually always No. They got their money's worth. I haven't been disappointed by a Hulk Hogan match on one of these shows yet. There was the Nikolai one. Yeah, but that was Nikolai. (laughs) Hogan was doing everything. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. On his fault. So here's the finish. I would have loved to see Flair versus Nikolai because I don't think Flair's getting much of a better match out of him. I mean, it's possible. So the finish for this here match is Hogan runs wild, and then rather than going for the axe bomber or the leg drop, he calls for the pile driver. He is going to finish Orndorff off with his own hold. He grabs Orndorff. He sticks Orndorff's head between his legs. And at this point, the camera cuts to a wide shot from like a three-quarter angle, which they never use, and they didn't use it again in the show. So I don't know why they did it right here. So Hogan's very small on the screen, and it's easy to overlook. But if you're paying attention, Hogan, before he does his pile driver, he does a little ass wiggle. <laughs> just because just, just he's Hulk Hogan, he's having a good time. Then, before he can hit the pile driver, what appears to be a woman in a dress jumps out of the crowd Some and attacks Hulk. Some fat sweat hog, says Jesse Ventura. <laughs> attacks Hulk Hogan for the DQ. I thought it was going to be Bobby Heenan in, in disguise. I did, too. The building. But no, it was the even more obvious answer of Adrian Adonis. It's funny because I, I figured it was Bobby Heenan because I watch so much bad wrestling nowadays that... Of course, that's what they would do. Like, Heenan got kicked out. He can't get in. But then, like, he's in. And it's never explained. This was Adrian Adonis. And the funniest thing was, Vince is going crazy about how it's Adrian Adonis in drag. Mm -hmm. I'm like, (laughs) isn't he always in drag? Have you not been paying attention? Wouldn't Adrian Adonis in drag be Adrian Adonis in, like, men's clothing? Well, now you've got my head in a loop. Sure. (laughs) This is a deep existential question. I was expecting to do philosophy on the show. He always wears women's clothing. So him being in drag would mean he was wearing men's clothing, right? I don't think that's actually true, but it's a good thought, Brian. Mm. (laughs) Anyway, this is ridiculous. So Adonis bumping all over the place like a crazy man. Adonis and Orndorff are double teaming Hogan. Out limps Roddy Piper to make the save. He is coming down to those crutches as, hard, as as fast as he can go. I don't know if Piper actually had a knee injury or if he was, they did this to cover up knee surgery or what, but he sold this limp start to finish on this program. And he gets in that ring, or actually he was even on the floor, I think, first, and he's swinging this crutch at the heels. He smashes Adonis in the arm. He's swinging at Orndorff in the ring. Hogan is behind Piper, but Piper's a wild man. He turns and swings wildly at Hogan. Hogan ducks the crutch because he's a hero and not a stupid baby face. He ducks the crutch, pops up, fists clenched, ready to fight. Piper realizes it's Hogan, which is not what he came out for. He falls on his ass in, in uh, not fear is too strong a word, but in surprise. There's a stare down between the two of them. And finally, Piper is the one who backs down and backs away. This is not the fight he came out here for. Hogan is confused by this finish and by the appearance of Roddy Piper, but in the end, he got the win. He's still the champion. The fans are still happy. It's time to flex. 